Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to those joining. I'm just admitting people into the from the waiting room. Um, so, uh, well, yeah, welcome to the fourth uh, Theology Thursday event uh, this evening based on the My Theology series of books. Um, I've just started talking and I'm just going to spotlight myself while I do this. Uh, my name's Will. Um, I'm from Darton, Longman and Todd, uh, and we're the publisher of the My Theology um, series. Um, the discussion tonight, uh, as you'll be aware, I'm sure, is between um, Guy Consolmagno, Director of the Vatican Observatory and President of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, and Keith Ward, Regius Professor of Divinity and at Oxford University, and it is chaired by uh, Virginia Moffat, editor, writer, and former Chief Operating Officer uh, at the Think Bank, Plesia. Um, once I've given a very short overview of the series and let a few more people in to, uh, to the event, um, I'll pass over to Virginia and, uh, and she'll get us underway. Um, but first, just a, a couple of house rules. Um, please, if you could, make sure that your audio is muted um, throughout. Uh, so we can hear Keith and Guy and Virginia clearly. And um, just to mention that the event uh, is also being recorded uh, because uh, we'll put a version of this on YouTube tomorrow, Monday, something like that. Um, so in the unlikely event that, you know, you, 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 you may turn up on the uh, video, I just want to say now uh, that you might want to disable the video feature in Zoom. Um, the other thing to say is that uh, towards the end uh, of the discussion, there'll be a chance to ask questions of both Keith and Guy, and you can post uh, these questions to me or uh, in the chat. I'll demonstrate how to do it once we're underway. Um, so I'm just going to omit one or two more people and then we will start. So um, a bit of background then on uh, the My Theology books. Um, My Theology uh, is a new series of pocket-sized books in which the world's leading uh, Christian thinkers explain some of the principal tenets of their theological beliefs. Um, uh, speaking as the publisher, basically uh, the idea was to find um, a suitable format for making theology more accessible to a wider readership uh, without necessarily uh, dumbing down. Um, if if theology is um, seeking understanding of God and of faith, uh, then, then we felt that it should be something that everyone can, uh, can appreciate. Um, so this series aims to make it something that can be uh, bought and understood by everybody, uh, we hope. Um, and we also hope that the series reflects a, a proper diversity of perspectives and experience um, to help demonstrate that theology uh, really is a diverse discipline uh, and that it can be done in, um, in, some, in some different ways. Um, and, and you'll hear that tonight. Um, so, uh, without further ado, I am going to um, hand over to uh, Virginia, and um, she will get things uh, underway. Hello, thank you very much for that introduction, and thanks again um, for inviting me to be at this event. Um, I, uh, um, Will has mentioned that this is a really diverse group of books, and every time I've come and picked up one of these books, I've found it so rich and really enhanced my understanding. So in a way, I think I'm the perfect reader for these series, and so it's really lovely to be able to have the opportunity to come and meet um, everybody. And so tonight I've really enjoyed meeting Keith and Guy already just, just before we started. And I've got some questions as, as usual to ask you. And um, I think they'll be really interesting. I'm really interested to hear your answers to them. So I'm, I'm starting off with a question I've asked everybody um, when we've done these, these, these talks. And I'm gonna start with you, Keith. And um, what I'd like to know is a little bit about your theological journey, what made you a theologian and what is core to your theology? Yes, well, um, I have been an atheist, uh, though I was brought up knowing about religion. My parents weren't religious at all, but I was sent to places like churches I could sing in the choir in. Um, so I uh, knew what religion was. Uh, I became a professional philosopher. That was my first academic job. So I was in philosophy for quite a number of years and taught at Glasgow, St Andrews, uh, London and Cambridge. And uh, uh, my attitude to religion, because I was a philosopher, was pretty anti on the whole, because philosophers are not supposed to be religious in Britain. Um, but uh, then I actually uh, had an experience, which I believed to be uh, an experience of uh, Jesus Christ. So that was a bit of a shock. And, uh, 
the result of that was that uh, I began to see sense in Christianity and um, I got ordained at the age of 34, I think then. So I went on to teaching philosophy, but um, because I was interested in religion, um, I slowly transfigured into a theologian, which my philosophy colleagues thought was a great disaster, really. Um, but uh, I think the theologians probably thought it was too. But anyway, there we are. And uh, I did become uh, the Regis Professor of Divinity at Oxford. I should say I retired a long time ago, 20 years ago. So I'm not the present uh, I'm the obsolete uh, religious, um, uh, you know, professor of divinity. I've uh, written quite a lot of books. I've always, uh, since I got ordained, I've always served as an honorary curate in any church that was nearby. Um, so I've always kept a pastoral uh, hand. And I think that combination of academia and the church has given um, me a rather strange almost split, but um, I think coherent view. I'm more philosophical than many theologians, but more theological than many philosophers. So that's where I am. And um, that's led to what I think. Thank you. That's really, that's really helpful. And I think I just to sort of say before I go on to Guy, it's an interesting um, part of this series is that, sorry, I think, it's a, is that me being echoey? Will, I'm sorry, can people hear? Sorry. Um, but an interesting part of this series is, is how many of the contributors started off as atheists and became theologians. And so before I move on to Guy, I'd just like to go, was it a reluctant experience or was it a transformative? Because quite often it seems to be God's almost dragged people into being theologians. Uh, yes, it was quite a long process, really. Um, at, uh, it was a bit of a surprise to me and more of a surprise to my wife, probably. Um, but anyway, I, um, it's been it's been totally good. I mean, totally good, and um, I um, I think I'm much more um, settled and uh, happy and fulfilled in the uh, Christian faith. Yes. Thank you, thank you. So, so going to you, Guy. Um, it's the same question, really. Is can you tell us a little bit about your journey to become a theologian and what's the core of your theology? Right. Well, of course. I'm a scientist, I'm not a theologian. And uh, somebody asked me when I wrote this book, did I pass it by the Jesuit theologians to make sure there was no heresy in it? And I didn't bother because it's really, the, the emphasis is on the mind, not the theology so much. The odd thing is my, one of the strong roots to faith was when as a young man, I prayed about entering the Jesuit order. I'd been educated by the Jesuits in my high school. And I firmly got a message from God saying no that, uh, oddly enough, I've never gone through this atheist period. I always believed. I believed in science, and I believed in religion, and I never saw a conflict between the two because they grew together with me. You know, I was a Sputnik kid. I was uh, a, a starting kindergarten when Sputnik was launched. I was starting my last year of high school when people landed on the moon. But as a young man from my first year at university, wondering what I wanted to do, I thought I would join the Jesuits mostly to get out of the freshman dorms because everybody else was partying and, and making too much of a ruckus and making terrible noises and getting sick and drunk. And, and I just wanted to learn things. So instead, um, I, I asked a Jesuit, you know, can I join the Jesuits as a way of getting away from all these terrible people? And he had a, a horrible answer. He said, you should pray about this. I'm 18 years old. Who prays? You know, come on. But uh, I, I followed his advice. I went to my room and I uh, was expecting God to, you know, I don't know, speak from the ceiling, something like that. And while I was waiting for a voice from the ceiling, this question popped in my head. What does a priest actually do for a living? And finally, I realized they deal with people, especially people with problems, just like these drunken 18-year-olds that I was trying to get away from, because that was not my talent. My talent was dealing with equations and, and complex but abstract ideas. And where I was happy was visiting my best friend who was studying physics at MIT. So I transferred to MIT and uh, went into the sciences, thinking that's where God was calling me, which was true. The next stage was when I turned 30, and I started wondering, why am I doing astronomy when people are starving in the world? 
and I didn't have an answer. So I decided it was time to quit astronomy. I joined the US Peace Corps. They sent me off to Kenya. And the next thing I knew, the Africans had me teaching astronomy at the University of Nairobi, which, you know, I could have done this back in Boston. Why am I doing this? But when I talked to the Africans I met up country where my fellow Peace Corps volunteers were, I saw they were curious about the universe. They wanted to look through my telescope. They wanted to know about what NASA was discovering around the other planets. And I finally understood the truth of that phrase, we do not live by bread alone. If we don't feed our souls, if we don't feed our curiosity, if we don't feed the things that make us more than just well-fed cows, then, you know, all the, uh, the, the food we give people does no good if we're just, you know, feeding them like we would feed a cow or a cat. I went back to America. I started teaching rather than just doing research. I loved that so much that it finally hit me at the nearly the age of 40 to enter the Jesuits as a brother, not a priest. And I could do this teaching as a brother, as a Jesuit and as a brother. Unfortunately, they make you take these vows. Poverty, I was used to, I'd been a graduate student. And chastity, I was used to, because I'd been a graduate student. But obedience, I was not used to. And under obedience, they ordered me to go to Rome, to live in this you know, miserable palace with all these dirty books, look at that boring scenery, eat that terrible Italian food, um, work in a laboratory with a thousand meteorites. And, you know, I had to obey. What could I do? So this is where I've been for the last 30 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, that's that's a lovely thing to be asked to to do, to go and um, look at, look at the, the universe, which is, I guess, what astronomers do. Um, and I think, it's, again, it's very interesting. Our last one of these sessions, um, we had two scientists. So we, so we did a lot of, we had a lot of discussion that time about the kind of inter, inter, interlinking between God and, and science and how they're not um, they're not um, mutually exclusive. So it's interesting to me that you're sort of talking about this being the Sputnik generation and that learning. And you talk a lot in your book about the need to look, that we that we look at the moon and we look at the stars. Um, and that's obviously clearly very important in terms of scientific ob observation. But what is it, do you think, that calls us to look at the world? Why do we want to look at the world? And what can we gain from that? And how does that help us under understand God? One of the odd things really is to me is the question, why don't people look? What stops them from looking? Every kid is curious about astronomy. I've never had a hard time talking to astronomy to, to little kids. Um, I remember once I was asked to give a talk to a group of second graders at uh, Ardingley. And uh, there was one little girl who had her hand up for every, you know, do you know how many planets there are? She knew. And do you know what's the biggest planet? And she knew. And so finally I asked, you know, so who's that little girl? And they said, oh, you mean Hermione. And they actually had named her Hermione and she lived up to it. But every child has that kind of curiosity. Where do we lose it? Where do we decide that it's not cool to be interested in looking at the moon? Just to go out and look at the moon at night. Not even with a telescope, not even, you know, as a point of view of a scientist, but just to look at it and see how beautiful it is. When did we stop looking at sunsets? You know, there's a sunset every night and they're free. But somehow we forget to look. And to me, that's the perfect analogy for how, even though God is there with us all the time, waiting for us to, to, to start the prayer, to pick up the phone, as it were, we're reluctant to do it. We're afraid to almost. And um, sort of, you, you're talking a bit about, about what you can um, you can learn from. Has, has Guy frozen? You, are you still there, Guy? No, sorry, you, I'm still there. Right, you're right. still there. No, sorry, that's all. You're frozen. Yeah. Frozen my screen. Um, so you 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 talk about. Um, that sort of thing that, that God is there, but we don't always look for God. So there's that sort of analogy uh, about it. But but you also talk at the end about what what does that looking give us? What when we actually stop and we do do look, what can we what do we gain from that? Um, I always go back to soulmate. People think that modern science has told us the universe is huge, and therefore if the world is so big, God can't possibly see us. The psalmist who wrote Psalm eight knew that, you know, 2,500 years ago. 
And uh, I'm not good enough to be able to, to recite the words perfectly, but essentially he says, God, who are you that you will talk to me even though I'm so small and that yet you have made us you know, less, only a little bit less than the angels or maybe a little bit more than the angels depending on your translation. It makes us remember that the universe is bigger than what's for lunch. It makes us remember that the universe is bigger than, you know, who's the prime minister or how's my football team doing or what's going wrong with my romance and my love life. It makes you remember that it puts the perspective that is full of hope because it's not just a universe that's bigger than that. It's a universe that's beautiful. It's a universe that is logical. You couldn't study it with science if it wasn't logical but it's also beautiful. And there's no reason it had to be beautiful, but it is beautiful. I think that's so true. And um, the, that thing about logic is I have a, my goddaughter is a scientist and she, she's an engineer. And um, and I was just talking to her, I, I love the Perseids that come, if anyone knows the Perseids, the meteor shower that come every year. Um, and I was saying how beautiful it is and how remarkable I find that it happens. And she sort of looked at me a little witheringly and said, well, well, auntie, that's just science. It's math that they, they do this. But it's actually, even though that it's math and science and it's completely predictable, like eclipses, it's, a, it's, a, it's astonishing that it happens every time. So I, I, I really echo that sort of sense of astonishment and wonder. And if you can give that to people, that's an amazing thing to be able to my, do. My, my math professor told me an important word as he was explaining a bit of mathematics to me. He said, look at this, it's elegant. Hmm. It, terribly elegant indeed. Um, so, so moving over to you, Keith, I think, um, you know, obviously I think astronomy gives us this kind of great joy and energy and um, the wonder of the world. And as you mentioned in your introduction, you're a philosopher and philosopher, philosophy gives us a completely different view of the world, but I think there are some overlaps. Um, how do you think, um, philosophy helps us affirm the exist existence of God, and how does it, looking at philosophy help us understand the world? Well, I think that uh, most philosophers who have been heard of throughout the whole of Western history, at least, have been theists. They have believed that there is a great uh, intelligence, intelligence behind the universe, and uh, there is concern, as Guy was saying, with beauty and that uh, mathematics good mathematics is elegant, good astronomy is beautiful, <laughs> and, and science has an interest in beauty above all, and that's not just uh, uh, an abstract uh, uh, intellectual thing, it's to do with the feelings that we have as we respond to the way the world is. But I think, um, well, I've got my own philosophy, and philosophers all disagree. I mean, they're worse than the theologians. They all disagree with each other. And I'm an idealist. And that, uh, I define an idealist as a person who thinks mind is prior to and more important than matter. So, of course, matter is beautiful, to put it in a nutshell, because it expresses a beautiful mind. Uh, and uh, I think of God in terms of the mind which is expressed in the nature of the universe. Uh, and I think that uh, the two great philosophical axioms I always started from, even in my anti-religious days, was that all, your, all human knowledge begins with human experience, begins with consciousness of truth and beauty and goodness and experience. And you can never deny that or deny that it exists. So a lot of philosophers these days, maybe the majority, well, quite a lot, anyway, are materialists. They think that everything is just lumps of matter and they have no purpose, no value. Uh, meaning is something that comes wrong uh, and disappears again with the death of the universe. So it wasn't very important. And I think that's the reverse of the truth. And the, what philosophy tells you, well, at least the sort of philosophy I like, idealist philosophy, is that actually these things, the concern with beauty and truth and goodness, are the heart of reality. They're what is most real in human experience. And in fact, uh, I think good science, I resonate a lot with what Guy said, that good science is an exploration of beauty and truth. And uh, good scientists, even if they're atheists, will die for the truth. And, and they give up comfort for the sake of truth. 
Well, the fact is you don't really have to do that because the truth is something that tells you there is a mind which is expressing itself in the elegance and beauty or, and the extraordinary um, organized complexity of the universe. So I think philosophy really is going through a materialist phase at the moment. There's no doubt about it, as science often is as well. If you see people on television, sometimes scientists saying, oh, well, you know, it's just by chance, it's by accident, it won't last long, uh, just a few billion years or so. Uh, but in fact, I think philosophy uh, is a, always a questioning discipline and will ask, well, is that really true? Isn't isn't human consciousness an experience of friendship and love and beauty? Isn't that uh, the reality which underlies the whole world? So that's uh, my view of it. Uh, it's uh, a slightly unfashionable philosophical view, but it is the view which has been held by almost every great philosopher in history. In fact, both Eastern and Western. One of the interesting things you mentioned, are, you know, the, the scientists you see on television, but of course, yeah. it's usually about 30 years behind where the rest of the field is. <laughs> yeah, I uh, think <laughs> and uh, one, you know, when you're a scientist and you see a problem, you can immediately think of five different ways to attack it. And you only have the time and the resources to choose one. And you choose the one that seems the most elegant, that seems the most beautiful, that seems to resonate with what made you want to be a scientist in the first place. It's, you know, science is not, I mean, astronomy is not stars and planets. Astronomy is human beings and what human beings have learned about stars and planets. But it's really the study of human beings wow. and human thought. Yeah, yeah. I find it extraordinary that what one um, very eminent scientist, Stephen Weinberg, uh, has said rather famously that uh, the more you understand about the universe, the more you see that it has no point. And he spent his whole life uh, seeking the point of the elegance and the beauty of mathematical theory. And it's extraordinary that his whole life is concerned with truth and beauty. And he says, well, there's no point in the universe, but that is the point. I, I actually, I have to brag. I. I... When I was a young postdoctoral fellow, I was walking down the halls of Harvard with Steven Weinberg on one side and Ed Purcell at the other, both of them Nobel Prize winners, wondering, what am I doing here in the same hallway as these guys? But it was actually Rabbi Sachs who had a wonderful book called The Great Partnership that directly attacked uh, that idea of the meaning of the universe, quoting the book of Ecclesiastes, you know, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And he says that can be read as meaningless, meaningless. The universe is meaningless because he then quotes Wittgenstein, the meaning of the universe can't be found within the universe itself. And that's why we have the genius of a supernatural God who can give meaning to the universe. Yeah, but of course, philosophers will not use the word supernatural. <laughs> In fact, uh, a lot of them in Britain these days call themselves naturalists to to say well and i asked i asked them um what they mean by being a naturalist and i have honestly what they said was well we're not quite sure but we're against the supernatural anyway <laughs> and that's what it is <laughs> uh, there people have a really odd idea of what they mean by supernatural they think ghosts are supernatural they think that yeah. you know mystical harry potter powers are supernatural no even if they were existing you know it would just be another kind of engineering yeah that's not what is supernatural what is supernatural is something that was there before the creation you know, when God said, let there be light, there's already a God before there's light. Yeah. Yeah, right. and that's, yeah. That, that, that's the sort of thing that um, I think um, is, it begets, it's when we get so quite mystical, the kind of the God that's before us, that's beyond us, that's above us, that's ahead of us, that's behind us. It, it's, it's hard to get your head around, really. Um, but what I wanted to touch on and then move into kind of a slight, another slight area question, which I think builds on what we've just talked about in terms of idealism. was so you were talking about consciousness. And, um, and I think this is an interesting thing as well um, that I've noticed in science in the last sort of decade or two decades is um, there's a lot of um, quantum physicists who talk about kind of consciousness and matter and and that sort of sense of we are all part of the universe and they almost sound like theologians when they're talking now um, and yet 
30 years ago, they probably would have sent, seen themselves as miles away from theology. And it feels like it's kind of coming together. There seems to be some science behind this idea that the consciousness exists beyond us and above us. Um, and, you know, and there are people who who almost sort of sound like they're talking science, but they're almost saying your soul, they're almost saying your soul can outlive you, but using it in kind of physics terms. And I just wondered if either of you had any thoughts or comments about that. Well, from a philosopher point of view, I'd like to say when I was um, studying philosophy with Gilbert Ryle in Oxford, he was uh, definitely um, not in favour of the supernatural, though his father was a bishop, as it happens. But anyway, uh, the uh, materialism then, that was, I suppose, in the 1950s, um, materialism was just regarded as ridiculous. I mean, nobody took it seriously. It's a very new theory, uh, philosophically speaking. And it's become popular because of the rise of AI and computing and uh, lo lots of things like that. But even so, even the toughest materialists will occasionally say, well, consciousness is the hard problem. We just can't quite account for consciousness. But they say, but as a matter of faith, we know that consciousness is just the firing of neurons in the brain. And I say, do you mean that's faith? And they say, yes. So I say, well, um, I've heard of something called faith, but you can have faith in other things than that. Yeah. It's interesting because um, people don't realize whenever you're trying to apply science to a problem like that, whenever you're trying to apply logic, you have to make assumptions. Every scientific system starts with its axioms. And depending, if you go in assuming that there is a God, that there is a supernatural, you can make sense of the universe. If you go in assuming there is not, you can also make sense of the universe you know, within its own limits. And each time you think, well, I've proved it. How can these other people be so wrong as to not see it? For instance, let's say you could put a machine on your head and see that whenever I was praying, whenever I was having a religious experience, um, I'd look to see if little neurons were firing in my brain. And if you're a believer and you see the neurons, you say, see, it's actually happening. And if you're a disbeliever and you see the neurons, you say, you see, it's just chemistry in the brain. In each case, you're, you're sort of recovering what you already believed. And if you don't see the neurons firing, then the believer will say, you see, it's supernatural. And the non-believer will say, you see, it doesn't actually exist. But you nonetheless, you wind up only seeing what you expected to see in the first place. And that, that's probably the limit of human brains and human experience in many ways. So I wanted to just move on a little bit from the philosophy of idealism. And I think it's quite interesting what you're saying about um, materialism being quite new, Keith, because I, th I because I think um, we, we also touched a little bit on our AI in our last conversation. Um, and I think there's a lot of quite well, there's lots of interesting stuff in the, AI, in the development of AI. There's also a lot of quite terrifying stuff about humanity and the nature of humanity and the nature of, um, of, of, of who we are and how we look after each other. And one of the things you talk about in your book is, is that um, the philosophy of idealism is a philosophy about cooperation and helping. So how, how do you think having that philosophy helps us kind of look after each other and cooperate with each other? So that question's to Keith. Right. Well, I think the, the thing is that science, pure science, which is just doing science and not asking how it's possible or anything like that, doesn't concern itself with either purpose or value. Um, most scientists I know would deny that there's purpose in the universe and would also say value that is subjective. It's, it's not, doesn't exist in the universe. Now, if you have a view that the universe is the expression of a, of a cosmic mind, what a guy calls a supernatural, I'm a bit uh, hesitant because all the other philosophers will throw me out of the club. Uh, but if you, have, if you see the universe as uh, the expression of mind, then you can see that purpose and value are part of the universe itself that a mind which creates the universe will have a purpose, a reason for, for there being a universe, and that reason will be a value. And so that gives you values to aim at and a purpose and the thought that you might actually be able to realize those values uh, and that the universe is not destined just for the big chill when it ceases to exist completely, but that beyond that, somehow, uh, human life and all personal life of many forms uh, can exist in a world where the purpose and value 
become clearer and fuller than we now see them. So that's yeah. what uh, that's what idealism gives you: a sense of purpose and value. Of there, each person is of value and has a purpose, and that's. Uh, and I think that's a, I think that's a very important um, point. I think you know some of the, some of the, some of the, the way we're living in the world now we're being told that some people are more important than others and some people have intrinsic value. So, so a billionaire like Elon Musk, who can go off to universe, people are trying to put, praising him for going off, off earth in his, in his space, space rocket, despite the fact he's not paying taxes and he's, he's not looking after his workers. And despite the fact what it's doing to the environment, him going off in his rocket, but he gets praise and sort of and glory in this in this world and yet somebody who has a disability or somebody who's homeless or somebody who's a refugee doesn't and I guess so I guess you know is that is that part of this philosophy of materialism that we're fighting with or is it is it something else and and how can we kind of bring that philosophy of idealism that comes and says everybody matters I think it's important, but I'd like to hear what Guy thinks about the the commitment to truth and beauty in science itself, which shows that even people who say there's no meaning to it actually are committing their lives to uh, uh, to it the existence or the reality objectively of value, and I think that's what in the end faith is about it's about saying there is a value which we have to realize in the world and which every person is able to contribute to uh, every person for that exception yeah. and and you, the point you made earlier that uh, even a scientist who thinks or calls themselves an atheist would be committed to truth yeah um there was a, a marvelous jesuit uh, philosopher I, I had to study with uh, um, michael buckley who wrote a book on atheism and made the point early on, to be an atheist, you have to have a very clear idea of the God it is you don't believe in, because otherwise, how can you know you don't believe in them? And there are a lot of pictures of God out there that I don't believe in either. You know, I only believe in one God. I've rejected all these others. The reason I go to the lab in the morning, it's better not be for fame or glory, because I'm not going to get any of that. It has to be for the love, the joy I get when I do what I do. And that joy I can identify as the presence of God. Um, and that's because of my theological training. That's because of my religious background. Other people can't see that. But they do see that there's a joy there and they don't know what it is, but they want it very much. Um, I think the other thing I just want to pick up on um, that, that, that kind of builds from that is that um, you talk, Guy, in your book about the importance of community in science and community in religion. And why do you think both science and religion have, and people of faith have this importance of community? Um, and, um, and again, how does that sort of link with what, what Keith's talking about, kind of the intrinsic value? Well, the whole point of doing the science is to be able to share it with other people. If you don't write it down, it didn't happen. It's one of the, you know, the hardest thing to teach in a university science class is laboratories to get the students to write down in their lab book what it is they did. Um, sometimes you can motivate it by pointing out uh, lab books that, you know, or allowed somebody to get a patent and make money. But of course, that's not really why you're doing it. It's so that you can share it. Um, you also need the community of people to give you the opportunity to do the science so that I can't build the telescope and make the observations and build the camera and do the data reduction. I've got to you know, pass out this work to the different people who can help me do it. I also can't remember to do the science if I didn't have a teacher ahead of me who taught it to me. And if I didn't have someone I could pass it on to, otherwise the science that I'm doing is utterly sterile and dead. So that sense of community is so the opposite of the lone genius that is part of you know, our Western culture. I'm a great fan of science fiction. I got into science because I read science fiction. But an awful lot of science fiction is based on this myth of the competent man, the lone genius, the, you know, the Doc Brown who's working in his basement and is gonna build the time machine. It doesn't work that way any more than you can find God without 
having somebody to tell you that there's a God there to find. Even if you're reading the Bible yourself, somebody had to write the Bible. Somebody had to print the books. Somebody had to tell you that there was something there to be found. And finally, you need a community of people to tell you when you're wrong. Because we're all going to be wrong. And it's especially when we're wrong that we least want to hear it. I absolutely agree with that. And uh, I think that's true in religion, too, that a lot of people these days, and I don't disapprove of them, but they invent their own religion, really. And they say, I'm starting again, and I'm not having anything to do with this old tradition. I'm going to have a new religion. And actually, we need that community of developing thought uh, and experience about religion over the centuries. We need to have that community to test our own ideas uh, against. And uh, the people I most uh, worry about are the people who think they themselves, by just thinking on their own, can find the truth in religion. They can't. They need to learn when doctrines became formulated, what they meant and what experiences people had. So you're absolutely right. Community, religion, it's not a dirty word. It's community, which you need to get your own ideas in order. One of the saddest things that every scientist experiences are the letters we get or the books we get written by somebody in their basement who's figured it out. Einstein was wrong. Here's my new theory. And it's tragic because they're in love with doing the same kind of stuff we want to do, but they've not been given the entree to the community of people to say, here's where the conversation is. Stop and listen to the... I tell the story in, in, in my book of being a child and hearing the grown-ups sitting around the fire on a Sunday, on a summer evening, you know, talking politics, talking sports, talking whatever. And we kids are hiding in the shadows, listening to them hoping that someday we can be part of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really useful um, thought that kind of is being part of the conversation. And, and when I was reading your book and you were talking about that bit, Guy, I, was, I, I really thought the thing that really jumped out at me was the body of Christ, that sort of, you know, we are one body, we need the eye, we need the ear, we need the hands, we need the nose. Every part of us has a part to play. And I think that, again, comes back to your idea of the kind of intrinsic value of everybody, Keith. So, so moving on to the kind of my last area of questions, and then I, I think we'll have some from the audience. Um, We've sort of talked, both of you talked kind of about cosmology um, and you talk, Guy, about the importance of imagination. So how does how does imagination help us understand the mind of God and the cos cosmos that God has created? Well, I'll go to the history. Um, everyone knows of Einstein in the theory of relativity. When you look into the history, you realize that all the pieces were there before him. Even the, the description of the shrinking of space and time at you know, high velocities. Um, what Einstein had was the imagination to see it as a system. You know, famously to imagine what would the universe look like if I were surfing on the crest of a wave? He didn't say surfing, but that's really what he meant. Um, George Lemaitre, who came up with the Big Bang Theory. Again, all the pieces had been there before. He was the first one to say, no, these are not just interesting pieces. This is a system that works together. And the pieces are all part of a bigger whole that is more than the individual bits. Um, when, when people talk about, you know, it's just material, a friend of mine says, yeah, if you look at a Seurat painting, it's nothing but dots of light and dots of paint. Well, of course it's dots of paint, but if you step back, it's also, you know, Sunday in the park with George. Yeah, and I, th I like that sort of thing, I mean, because you also talk about sometimes the imagination can get it wrong, because obviously we know, you know, the success stories in science of Einstein and Newton, and, you know, they got it right, they, they pulled it all together and they got it right, but they didn't do it on their own, they did it on the backs of others, but also part of it is getting things wrong, and one of the um, first things I learned when I went to university as a studying biology was I had been taught a, a theory about how plants grow towards the light, very famous theory called the Plodden Went theory. We were taught that as an absolute fact. And the first thing I learned at university was one of my lecturers had absolutely disproved that theory because he'd got a better, 
he got a better story and then mm-hmm. that's a better story that comes from imagination and somebody's just saying actually that bit doesn't quite fit so I think that imagination is really important how does that help us understand God having the imagination as well as understanding science how does it help us understand God I'm leaving that to you Keith oh, I, I was hoping you would speak um <laughs> Imagination, yeah. Well, imagination is good, but very dangerous because most people's imaginations lead to science fiction and also to religious fiction and philosophical fiction. So, um, yeah, imagination is a good thing, but expertise uh, and experience have to be present as well. Uh, And uh, one of the great dangers of our culture, in fact, is that people don't know who the authorities are they will believe almost anything they see uh, on some website uh, on the internet and so the problem is to to identify whose imagination is trustworthy and there's no easy answer to that question but there are in science for example we have in britain the uh, the royal society and you i think you're pretty well justified to say anybody who's a member of that ought to be at least listened to and and say well they know what they're talking about uh in religion unfortunately unfortunately though you'll get people especially in america who are experts in one thing and then will pontificate on things far beyond their expertise that's true. I know. I know that's very true. I know there was uh, a person asked to do a television series about religion in England, uh, and he knew nothing about religion at all. But he was a celebrity, and he said to me, "I knew him quite well." He said to me, "Well, they asked me, and they paid me, and I thought, <laughs> well, why not?" Um, so there are problems over that. So I think. I mean, imagination- part of the part- yeah. I mean, you you mentioned uh, fiction. It's important to remember that you can find truth in fiction. That's why stories are told in order to get a truth across. Even Jesus speaks in parables. He tells stories to be able to communicate a truth. But a good science fiction, the science had better be right or else the story doesn't work. A good philosophical piece of fiction, even if the story is invented, the philosophy. If, If the people wind up doing things that you say to yourself, I'm sorry, human beings don't act like that then I don't care how beautiful the language is, it's going to be a failed story. You're not going to believe it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, so moving on from the kind of imagination, um, what do we think, um, Keith, starting with you, Keith, maybe Guy can come in, is what do we think the purpose of the cosmos is and how are we connected to the cosmos and how, God, how does God connect us to it? Right. Well, I think if there is a purpose in the cosmos, just looking at this uh Uh, from the big bang to now you say well what's happened is that consciousness and concern for morality and truth and goodness have come about and friendship and love and it looks to me as though there are certain intrinsic values which didn't exist at the big bang like there was no consciousness there was no love there was no friendship Uh, and it looks to me as though if things go on I'm thinking here of Teilhard the, uh, the, the French Jesuit who uh, talked about um, the universe itself evolving towards what he called the point omega or towards um, a full realization of those things we find to be of absolute value now. And they include consciousness and wisdom, friendship, creativity. Uh, and those that is the purpose of the universe, I'd have thought, even not bringing God into it. You said the purpose, look as though it's doing things of intrinsic value for their own sake and because it's good to do so. And then if you ask the question, how did the universe come to be like that? Well, then you're thinking about something very like God, which makes it the case that it is right to aim at truth and beauty and goodness. And that's the purpose. It's- to, to, uh, to go back to that contrast between the things you've talked about and the things that science does. I love science. I'm a scientist. I'm delighted to do science. But the important word is love. I love science. Science gives me uh, a place where I can encounter the God of love, just as playing football gives you know, a field for someone who wants to express the love they have of what the human body can do and what human spirit and and teams can, you know, sportsmanship can do. 
there are all of these different theaters, there are all of these different platforms where we can encounter God. But I think encountering God, encountering the God of love, that's at the end of the day where we're finally going to be satisfied. Mm, definitely well thank you both for that that, that, that was a really interesting conversation and i think we can carry on because i think we've got some really good questions coming from the audience now um so i'm i'm going to read one and then whichever one of you wants to kind of come in and then you can the other one can can answer too so this is from um sorry i'm just trying to read it from from the, the um chat and it's a bit long hadi from hadi bella greetings from chile that's really lovely to have somebody from chile that's a long way away we've got um guys in italy and the rest of us are in england I would love to hear which kind of God did you find watching the universe? Can you share with us anything about God's personality that you have discovered out there? And that was personality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's, that's the perfect question because it is definitely a personality. You know, do I believe in a personal God? I've experienced the personality. And what I find is first of all, that God of surprises that everything is nice and logical, and yet when you follow the logic, you come across something you didn't expect at all. But as soon as you see it, you go, oh, of course, it had to be that way. And you know, you find that reflected in a really well-written book, a wonderfully written mystery where the, the, the detective outlines everything and he surprises you at the end with who was the villain, and you never would have expected it until suddenly you see it, it all makes sense. But also, I find a God who has a sense of humor, who is really enjoying this universe and wants to share it. Um, it's not enough to hear a good joke, you've got to tell somebody else. And the universe is full of things that just make you want to smile and laugh because you would never would have expected it. That's lovely. I don't know if you, I know that question was for Guy, but I don't know whether you have any thoughts, Keith. Well, I generally say that I, I think the two of the very important qualities of God that my imagination, tutored by Christian tradition, uh, would find is that God is creative. God is a creator, uh, surprises, new things, and also that God is responsive and God reacts uh, with empathy uh, and uh, I would even say suffers with humans who suffer and rejoices with humans who rejoice. So God is both uh, creative and responsive. And to me, the, uh, those are two very important qualities of the God that uh, I believe in. Lovely, thank you. So we have another um, question, and this is from Simon Cross. Um, and it's as if it's possible that I'd like to hear Keith talk a little bit about open and relational theology and perhaps whether he has an opinion as to why, although there are relational theologians in the US, there are apparently so few British theologians who are openly relational. I'm not sure what is meant by a relational theologian, but I suspect I am one. Um, maybe I'm the only one. In, uh, <laughs> but uh, if you mean... Uh, that God, the supreme spiritual principle, is not uh, self-enclosed and complete in itself, as it were, without reference to anything else. Uh, I think that contrasts with what you might call a relational God who uh, wills there to be other uh, personal beings with whom uh, fellowship and love can be expressed so I think that uh, if that's a relational God I think probably most theologians do believe that though um, perhaps the term is not uh, very much used so I think a relational God is a God not like Aristotle's God who was perfect and complete even without any universe at all but I rather think a, a more Jewish and Christian idea of God um, and probably a Muslim idea as well is a God who uh, essentially goes out from the divine to include other personal beings in the divine nature. Does Isn't that, that also... your question? So, so before we go to Kai, I just wanted to check with Simon, is that what you were trying to get at? So is there anything you wanted to qualify with that question? And then I'll come back to you, Guy. I mean, if you could unmic mute yourself, Simon, maybe to sort of say that. Sorry, Virginia. Yes, I was just trying to type in the chat. Uh, yes, I think I think uh, Keith 
gets uh, what I mean by relational and he'd already started speaking about God experiencing. Uh, so yes, very, very much so, and as opposed to Arist Aristotelian. Um, okay. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you. So Guy, you were going to come in and answer that question well, as well. I was, well, actually not so much answer as to, to ask uh, Keith, is that really you know, key to what is involved in a Trinitarian God? I think a I God is capable of relation even within God. Yeah, I think the doctrine of the Trinity tries to make that so a, a, a coherent view in some way that that God somehow enters into relationship rather than being a sort of big ego trip, like I'm the greatest and I like myself very much, which is okay. <laughs> Thank you both for that. Um, so we have another uh, question, and this time from John Gillibrand in Wales. And this is very, thank you, John. This is a really interesting question. Um, how do we respond to Christians who are explicitly hostile to scientific thinking, as well as to the heritage of the 18th century enlightenment? More broadly, are the values of the enlightenment now under greater threat than previously? I always thought of the enlightenment as sort of the adolescence of human thought. When you know kids, when you're a teenager, can come up with every obvious and wrong idea, and it really looks appealing for a while until you push it long enough and you go, "Wait a minute, the world's a little more complicated than that." Yeah, well, Immanuel Kant, a philosopher I'm interested in, sort of defined the Enlightenment uh, in the phrase "think for yourself." Now that's both good and bad. I mean, I think it is true. You should think as hard as you can for yourself. That's true. But you should never think that you're always right. And to <laughs> tell a lot of people that they should think of themselves leads them into blind alleys of the most terrible sorts. So again, thinking for yourself needs to be complemented with, well, have a respect uh, for what other people are thinking and, and try to discern uh, the valuable from the less valuable. So, yes, I'm all for the Enlightenment and for uh, freedom of thought, but but I would want to say, well, we ought to respect the traditions. I mean, no, nobody would say, theory of relativity, oh, just think for yourself. No, no you wouldn't say that. They do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, when I was in, you know, in the 60s as a teenager, I remember kids would have these buttons that said, question authority. Yes. And I always wanted to say, question authority, says who? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, just coming back to John's, the other part of John's question is, do you think that the, the, the kind of the, the kind of scientific thought, how do, how do we deal with, with Christians who, you know, I mean, you know, we see it a lot, I, mean, I, I guess, in things like the, um, that, um, you know, uh, museum in the States that um, is pretending that there's no such thing as evolution and it's a creation mm -hmm. universe, you know, and it, it's, it's right. completely illogical science-wise and it doesn't even make sense in terms of the Bible, but they've worked out the Bible 6,000 years and that's, that's science. Um, how do we deal with that? The, the fundamentalists fundamentally have no faith in their faith. You know, when I'm in the kitchen trying to make a cake, I'm a fundamentalist. I follow the cookbook because I'm not a good enough cook to be able to invent a recipe off the top of my head. I have to follow what somebody else has written out. Um, there are people who can go into a kitchen, see the ingredients and whip up something marvelous. They're better than I am. And I re respect that. Um, so when you don't have a lot of faith in your faith, you're falling out of rules. You have to recognize that the set of rules are there to help you along to someplace better. They're not the answer in itself. Yeah. The, real, the real difficulty with fundamentalism to me is that it says I've got the answers. And a science that had all the answers would be a dead science. It's the places where we don't have the answers that makes it interesting. A love relationship where, you know, well, I figured her out. I don't need to you know, talk to her anymore. I know exactly who she is. No, you're not in love with that person anymore. You know, my parents were married for 72 years before they died, and they were still learning things about each other. So a fundamentalism that's afraid to say, this is true, but let me learn more. On the other hand, you know, these people in the States that call themselves creation scientists, they're still using the word science. They still want that cachet. Yeah, that. I think education is the only answer, but uh, the trouble is that um, uh, education means critically 
looking at the sources of the things that you're saying, who said it, when was it said, is there a reason why it was said, and that critical but sympathetic uh, appreciation is something which is needed. So I, I agree entirely that uh, you, if you're critical, you're always going to say, well, a theory of relativity, of course, I can see that it's a magnificent breakthrough, but probably we need to relate it somehow to quantum physics, and I can't quite do that. Uh, and then, then, you, then you say, well, uh, well, that's good, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're still looking for the absolute yeah. truth. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the difficulty yeah. with education is too often people stop before they really get to the good stuff. When we teach physics to a 15 year old, they pass the test if they can get the answers in the back of the book. Yep. But of course that's not physics. Yeah, and I think that that's a really interesting thing to me because it, it comes back to what I said about you know that that's that theory I was told was absolute truth until I got to university, and I think the other thing that I, I thought was absolute truth was I thought that scientists were good people, and my lovely lecturer who was um, who was who's my favourite who's my favourite who's my wonderful tutor, um, and he said would regale us with stories about scientific cheatery and bakery, and it was quite a shock to discover that, but that, that's a slightly different. Um, uh, a whole different other ball game. So I've got another question, um, and that is from Barry Malister. Um, what books are instrumental both in your theological learnings and education, or in Keith's case, conversion to the discipline of theology? Theology. I didn't get that. Sorry. Right. I'll say it again. Um, what books were instrument oh, instrumental books. in both your theological learnings and education, or, or in your case, conversion? That's a difficult one. Uh, I don't know. Um, well, the books that I would mention are very boring. I wouldn't recommend them to anybody, uh, but they, they were instrumental for me. Um, the Critique of Pure Reason by Emmanuel Kant. <laughs> I don't recommend you to read that. Um, so they were books which undermined uh, old certainties and put before me possibilities uh, which I hadn't thought of before. So they were very boring books, but, you know, uh, which I now write myself. Um, I'm, I'll go back to Chesterton's orthodoxy. You know, unfortunately, Chesterton would never tell one story when five was available to him. So it's, it's you know, he, he does go on and on and on. But if you can get through the verbiage, he has a marvelous way of making you stop and question the cliches that we use all the time to explain the universe when maybe those cliches are uh, papering over uh, a reality very different from what we think we're looking at. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting, thank you. Um, and then this is a question from Robert. I'm an ex-computer scientist. I used complex maths IT models to construct an external reality. How do such models coming from within model external truth? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, what I did, I actually talk about uh, computer modeling in my little book, because that's the first thing I did. I you know, was trying to understand the icy moons of Jupiter and I did it through a a long and spaghetti-like uh, set of Fortran code. This was all written before structured programming had even been invented. Uh, and so I made every possible mistake you can make in programming. The best thing about looking at the universe from the point of view of a model is not that you believe the model at the end of the day, because you've already got the universe there. You don't need the model to tell you what the universe is. But in the construction of the model, you find yourself asking questions. Oh, how does this particular bit work? What's the equation that would, oh, what are the, uh, the, the factors that make a difference? Oh, what turns out to be important and what can I ignore? And so it's in the process of making the model that you learn about the universe. Um, it's almost like doing a crossword puzzle. When you're finished with the puzzle, you throw it away. It's the fun is in the doing. Yeah, right. very interesting. Keith, have you thoughts on that? Well, no, it's just that I, I remember um, 
there's quite a famous article in mathematics about um, uh, the fact that uh, it is uh, very unexpected and even unreasonable that our mathematics, which we do uh, construct on perhaps on the back of an envelope, uh, actually fits the universe. And I think that's a sign that the universe actually is uh, existing on intelligible and highly complex mathematical terms. And again, that points to a mind, something mind-like mm -hmm. Uh, in in the structure of the universe itself, so that our minds are able to understand a little of how that mind is actually operating. It's certainly consistent with the existence of such a mind, it and is. that's good enough for me. Yeah. Uh, and of course, if you want to start an argument among mathematicians, you ask, is mathematics invented or discovered? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I think that's an interesting kind of parallel for, for God as well, in terms of, you know, cause, because science is kind of that discovery that we, you know, and, and we, we all, every generation knows and learns a little bit more of the picture and leaves, leaves those footprints for other people to follow and develop into the future. And, and it, it'll be a future that we won't see because, it, you know, 10, 100 years time, people will look back and things we think they all think are com completely archaic but they think it's new to us. And it feels to me like God's a bit like that too, that, that we can only know so much about God, but we won't see the, the whole till the end when we're kind of united with, with heaven, whatever that is. And that might be I, a last I, question for you. Sorry, Jason. Yeah, I, re I remember the religion I learned as a child and nothing I was taught was wrong. But the religion that I have at this point in my life is a lot more complicated, richer, and in some ways simpler because I've now experienced enough of life to be able to say, oh, that's what they were talking about. And I hope that never stops. Hmm. Hmm. That's, a lovely, that's a lovely way to sort of think. So, so my final question, which I hadn't prepared, but, it, but kind of, I think it's sort of come out of these conversations is um, thinking about that, you know, that, that learning, that journey is, is hopefully, so, you know, coming to God in, in different traditions, which you talk about a little bit in your book, Keith, that we can learn from it from different traditions. Other traditions have that kind of, you know, that sense of nirvana in Buddhism, that sense of at some point we will meet God and know, understand and know everything. Um, so have you, vision, have you a vision of that ending, that meeting with God, that heaven or whatever we like to call it? What does that look like or, or can you put it in words? Mm, well, the only words I have come from the New Testament, which says we do not know what Christ is, but we do know that when we meet him, we will be like him. Hmm. Like that. <laughs> That's good. That's good. And, and Guy? Uh, the words I come back to from the scripture is heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Hmm. And the thought, that idea, that word, that logos from which, you know, the, the Greek word from which we get the word logic, those intangibles are the things that continue when every book is turned into dust. Hmm. Wonderful. Well, I think that's that those two finishing wonderful ways. And thank you so much for yet another really rich and rewarding conversation. And thank you for your books. I highly recommend these books. They're really good books worth reading and as, as they are ones in the series. And so thank you for your time. And I will hand back to Will and you can kind of sum up. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Virginia. And for chairing the discussion, uh, discussion and of course to uh, Guy and Keith for sharing both your time and um, your valuable insight and um, inspiration and of course theology this evening. Um, both Guy and Keith's uh, My Theology books um, are available um, as of yesterday as it happens um, in pocket-sized paperback. Um, you can see the covers over my shoulders, uh, Finding God in the Universe uh, by Guy and Personal Idealism by Keith um, and they're both available as I said in paperback uh, uh, online and uh, in good bookstores everywhere uh, for, for $8.99 and or a reduced rate depending on where you shop. Um, there are eight books in total in the first issue of the series and we'll have eight more to come in the new year. Um, tonight's event will be edited and made available on YouTube in the coming days um, and I'll circulate a link to all attendees just the one of email in case you want to uh, listen again uh, because I thought yeah it was a very rich, dis rich discussion and um, and when the link arrives, please do share with anyone you think might be interested because uh, we're keen to um, spread word of the series uh, yeah, uh, far and wide. So all that remains to say is thank you all for coming and uh, thank you again to Guy, Keith and Virginia. Thanks, guys.